Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I want to thank Don and Allison uh, for this uh, opportunity to give the MOOC a lecture. Um, sometimes you get asked to give these lectures, and uh, as somebody mentioned last night, you don't know much about the person whose picture is on the slide, but as listed, uh, Peter and I were residents together. He was a year ahead of me. Uh, he became my mentor. I was the first chief resident on the emergency room surgical service at the Mayo Clinic when Peter initiated that service, and we came, became fast friends after that. Uh, without getting too much uh, into what he accomplished and what it was like to work with Peter, I will tell you there is also a MOOCA lectureship at the Mayo Clinic which mimics the one at West Virginia. And it's so unusual in academics for two separate academic institutions to have a named lectureship in honor of the same person. So Peter's uh, premature death was a, a real loss to many of us. Uh, primarily because in addition to being a wonderful friend, he was about as charismatic an individual as I have ever met in my life, and I really mean that. If you'll indulge me for a second, um, Peter was a handsome guy with three incredibly beautiful and intelligent children. My two sons always used to say, why do we have to be friends with the Mookas? Their kids are so damn smart. Uh, we used to ski together every year, and as I told several people last night, Skiing with Peter was an, a real event because he unfortunately liked to smoke a lot. And we would ski about 200 yards, and then Peter would say, I'd have to have a cigarette. And so we would all lay down in the snow, Dr. Pachter, the chairman at NYU in New York, Peter and myself, and Peter would smoke a cigarette. And we'd just loaf and get sunburn. And then we'd ski another 200 yards, and the same thing would happen. And while all our friends would make 10 runs in the morning, we would make two. It was just incredible. So uh, we traveled together. Um, this is in uh, the historic capital of Japan that Don can certainly relate to. Dr. Moore there with the mustache. Frank Sarah, the director of the Health Science Center of Minnesota, who retired last year. And Bob Wright, who's an eminent intensivist in Australia. So we spent a lot of time together. And I can only tell you there's a generation of people who trained at the Mayo Clinic and at West Virginia and at Penn State who benefited from knowing Peter Mucha. I'm going to talk a little bit about patients today. And one of the interesting things about any career, whether you're in private practice or academic practice, is when you first start, there's very little to do. I remember sitting in my office at the county hospital in Houston with nothing to do. I had no patients. They hadn't scheduled a clinic for me. I wasn't writing any papers. I wasn't doing any studies. And I had this little tiny office, my secretary and I together, and I had nothing to do. Little did I know. What happens, as all of you in private practice know, are all the things to the left of the slide. And academically, you get involved in a variety of activities. And all of a sudden, one day, you're a professor, and you're working 70, 80 hours a week. And you realize, my God, I don't have any time for patients. It's frightening. And it's something everybody has to fight, particularly in the academic arena. Because one of the things I've learned in my 35-year career is that our greatest learning and most satisfying experiences, and as you'll hear occasionally, our worst heartaches are related to our interactions with patients. Hence the name of this lecture for the patient. I'm going to present six patients. And if the residents didn't get enough surgical history last night, you're going to get some more this morning, so you'll be well-versed. Going to present a case and then the historical connections, if there are any, and then what I learned from taking care of these patients. And needless to say, these are not routine operations. So I'm going to present them just as you would uh, if you were a resident presenting. This first patient is a 31-year-old male with a gunshot wound to the lateral aspect of his left arm. And because he was hemodynamically stable, he was admitted to a holding area in the hospital. And a very astute nurse called me up and she said, you know, the darnest thing is happening with this patient. When I take his blood pressure one minute, it's 120. And when I take his blood pressure 15 minutes later, it's 50. And she said he has this wavering blood pressure. So I ran down to the holding area. 
and sure enough, his left wrist pulses were coming and going. In those days, we did an aortogram, and the bullet had traversed his shoulder area, and as you can see clearly, has a complete occlusion of his left subclavian artery. There's no bleeding. His arm is viable. You know, there are probably some people who would say, well, this is a non-dominant arm. Let's see how the patient does. But it was interesting on a later view of this x-ray, for the resonance in particular, you can see the left axillary artery completely reconstitutes through collaterals, which explains why his blood pressure was normal sometimes, because collaterals can be wide open or not so normal other times. So we decided to operate, and as all of you know, if you've read the books and looked at the pictures, there are a lot of approaches to the great vessels in the superior mediastinum and subclavian area. So you have to choose, if you will, which operation you're going to use. And if you go back historically, my goodness, there's Dr. Halstead again, uh, as we discussed last night, talking about ligating the first portion of the left subclavian artery in 1892. For God's sakes, they did all this again in the past. And again, Dr. Schumacher, former chairman of my home institution, Indiana University, a famous World War II surgeon who tackled all these vessel injuries in the superior mediastinum, described resecting the clavicle, had to expose all these things. Excuse me. So we made a left supraclavicular incision and immediately encountered, after the usual dissection, a left subclavian artery that was thrombosed. If you look at the very bottom of the slide, <clears throat> You can see a contusion in the wall of the artery. There's no pulse beyond that. And we have a pretty straightforward vascular situation, sort of analogous to blunt trauma, blunt thrombosis of a major artery, no bleeding, how great that is. Uh, we decided to dissect a little bit more proximally and got into torrential arterial bleeding. Immediately had to add two more incisions, case getting interesting now, a left anterolateral thoracotomy and a median sternotomy. And the residents know this is called a book incision, right? What a terrible name. This will not open like a book unless you break all the ribs, right? So this creates a three-sided flap with sharp edges that can only be opened with a sternal retractor. It's an incredibly painful incision for a patient. And this is what it looks like. But what we did is we uh, put in a graft, as I just briefly showed you there, right at the top of the slide, a Dacron graph, which we felt was appropriate at, at Baylor at the time. And we, as we were doing that, we tried to get some further distal control again and now got bleeding from further on down in the shoulder. And we had to extend these three-sided incision to an infraclavicular incision here. So now we really have an interesting operation. So far we have three incisions and now we've extended one of them. We extended the Dacron graft to the left axillary artery because we found a second arterial injury, not just a subclavian, but now an axillary. We released our clamps. There were no pulses at the wrist. We did an arteriogram, and sure enough, the brachial artery was injured as well, a third major artery from one bullet tracking from the arm to the shoulder. So we had to extend our incision into the classic biceps, triceps, groove incision immediately. This is a happy camper in a public hospital. Look at those incisions, boy, I'll tell you. You can see the bullet hole. He's got booming pulses. But I will tell you, this case certainly took any number of years off my life because I could not anticipate three separate vascular injuries in a patient. So what did I learn on this patient for the residents? Everything about trauma, if it's not in the brain, as you know, is hemorrhage, as we discussed in the previous case. I learned a long time ago that time spent in the emergency room, time spent in imaging in hypotensive patients is not in their best interests. And I think one of the things it's really hard to emphasize to residents today because of the so many controlled situations you're in with attendings around all the time and elective surgery, minimal access, that everything you do in your training, every conference you go to like this, everything you read, see and do during your residency and fellowship training is your cumulative experience. And we were prepared for this case because we knew how to do all these incisions. We knew where the arteries were. We knew the principles of vascular surgery. Another big lesson I learned on this case for the residents, again, you're in a minimal access era. 
And I was doing a laparoscopic gallbladder about 10 days ago, and this was a patient who had had acute cholecystitis for seven days and couldn't get a surgeon in Indiana to tackle him. So he came to the university and I did him. And after 90 minutes, I said to the resident, I said, I'm not gonna be able to get this out laparoscopically. And I thought the resident was gonna have a heart attack because we have this advanced group of laparoscopic surgeons at IU and you know, I don't think he'd ever seen anybody converted. He had seen some six hour gallbladders. So anyway, you can only fix what you can see guys and get it in your heads. If you can't see, make an incision or make it bigger. And thirdly, when you do thoracic trauma, no matter how many incisions you make and how much it looks like a, a tic-tac-toe or whatever, they all heal. They never get infected, so never apologize. You think that patient's incisions are bad? I can give you a whole lecture on my thoracic incision patients. I have done some incredibly dumb things. They always heal. Second patient, Mr. Lynn Masters. A nice man, 34-year-old man, walking on the streets of Atlanta in my first week as an attending. He is stabbed in the left chest during a robbery. We didn't take attending call in the hospital at that time. Grady was run by chief residents at night. That was another time. The residents did an emergency center thoracotomy, fixed the left ventricle, and called me at home to gloat, I guess. I said, Dr. F, we saved a patient with a big left ventricular wound. He's doing great. You don't need to come in. I was really, really humbled by that phone call, believe me. I got a second phone call approximately 20 minutes later. I hadn't gotten back to sleep yet. And it says, by the way, the knife that hit the heart also went into the liver through the diaphragm, but the patient is doing well. You don't need to come in, Dave. Great, okay. A third phone call was 15 minutes later. And this time they said, quote, the patient is bleeding everywhere and doing poorly. How quickly the situation changed. So I lived 2.4 miles away in Atlanta and I drove as fast as I could. We had a coagulopathy intraoperatively. We had bleeding from the liver. We packed it. We didn't know much about open abdomens in those days. So the only thing I could think of to ask for was a steri drape. Um, he was bleeding so badly that I didn't know what to do with the sorocotomy, so I just closed the skin with towel clips. And I guess this is the uh, sort of origins of damage control. We have a very weak, thin-walled silo over the open abdomen. We have a colostomy bag on it, as you can see, because I couldn't figure out how to drain fluid. I mean, we knew nothing about open abdomens when I started this. And then I towel clipped the skin of the chest. I never closed the thoracotomy. And then I learned about the real world of the public hospital I was, I was just starting to work in, where residents had run the show for years and attending surgeons were absent. I called the ICU. I said, I have this critically ill man whose heart had stopped at, you know, and had a big operation. And the nurse gave me the usual, there are no ICU beds available. So I was new, but I wasn't stupid. I knew the patient was going to die if we didn't get him to a warm place with good care. So I simply moved the patient to the ICU and just crashed in with this bed and this open abdomen. They immediately called the man who I was going to replace as chief of surgery, Roger Sherman, who came in from home to lecture me. And subsequently, eight nurses filed incident reports against me. This is a true statement. Every nurse in the ICU, they all got together and said, we're going to file an incident report against this new attending because he didn't pay attention to no ICU beds available. So I reoperated after getting him an ICU bed 24 hours later, and I immediately learned another lesson as soon as I released his abdominal tamponade by taking off this uh, flimsy silo, he had an asystolic cardiac arrest. Now, you know, there are all kinds of cardiac arrests, but I could see his heart and his heart wasn't beating. And I, what I remember critically from that moment is, I remember looking at the ceiling thinking God was up there and I said, you son of a bitch. We, we saved this patient last night. How dare you have him arrest? I was so angry, frustrated, and after 20 minutes of internal cardiac massage, a lot of drugs, lo and behold, even though it was asystole, his heart started to beat again, and we put on the silo and towel clips again. I took him back on the 12th day. Remember, we didn't have Vax or anything. I thought we could close everybody in those days. Really struggled, got him closed. Didn't know what to do with the thoracotomy, so I just left the towel clips on until he healed. 
There was the same patient 45 days later. Again, we've never closed the chest incision. My abdominal closure under tension is pulling apart. Same patient 193 days later, same patient nine years later. And other than my thinning hair, he looks pretty good, really. You know, it's amazing. And he's never agreed to have his abdominal wall reconstructed. I met with the, the patient and his wife, and they said, you know, we've tested God once or twice here, and we really don't think another operation is in his best interest. All the years I was in Atlanta, I got a Christmas card from his family every year. So what did I learn for the residents or the attendings? I, I learned that a second phone call from a trainee in a short period of time is a message, and I probably should have gotten out of bed and driven to the hospital. These days it would not be a problem because we're all there. And the second thing I learned, and you have to really believe in this for the residents here, that you're going to run into people who are obstructionists even in the best hospitals, and you have to figure out a way to jump over them go around them, do an end run for the patient. I'm really serious about this. This comes up more than you're going to believe in your career. Oh, we can't do that test today. Oh, we're overscheduled. Oh, we have three GI ble you know, endless discussion, you know, with people in the hospital who maybe are, have their heart in the right place and sometimes they don't. So you are the patient's advocate. There were a lot of medical lessons I learned on this case. I mean, look at all of them. We learned about damage control. We learned about periapatic packing. We learned about silos. I'd never heard of reperfusion asystole that John Morris described at Vanderbilt. I'd never bothered to read Oscar Ramirez's paper on components. A lot of the things we touched on last night and in the case presented this morning. I will remind you that this is probably the classic paper on damage control from uh, Mike Rotundo, Bill Schwab at the University of Pennsylvania. As many of you know, Dr. Rotundo is now at the University of Rochester and Dr. Schwab has stepped down as trauma director. They wrote this really helpful paper and a lot of us had sort of recognized that prolonging operations in bad patients was not a good idea. Uh, what I think people forget is the concept of damage control came from the Navy. Dr. Schwab was lieutenant commander and there, in the Navy manual, there's this, this description of damage control, capacity of a ship to absorb damage and maintain mission integrity. So when the, the USS Cole was blown up in the harbor and aid in Yemen and all those sailors were killed and there was a hole the size of this room in the side of the ship, the ship never sunk, right? They never sunk. That ship, they actually kept it afloat and got it back to a safer port. And that's damage control, and that's now been translated into medical care. When we started damage control at Grady, I couldn't get anesthesia and the nurses to understand what we were talking about, and so we put up signs just like this. They were pink in every operating room. We told all the employees in anesthesia, if we have a patient with any one of the three things on this slide, we're going to limit our operation to one hour. And the signs actually helped because they at least they understood that we were going to have a short, quick operation and they couldn't screw around looking for equipment and all. And eventually they understood it was good medically for the patients. For the residents, what we figured out at that time was that the patients were much more likely to die from their uncorrected shock state, hypothermia, acidosis, coagulopathy, than from your failure to put two ends of the bowel together, as per the case this morning. The other thing, again, is we learned in, to revivify periapatic packing. There's a small subset of patients with hepatic trauma, usually grade four or more injuries, who become coagulopathic, even in the modern era. And the longer you spend trying to fix it with sutures or the argon or something, you're going to kill a patient. And you just have to get out. And packing as tamponade works well. And as I reminded everyone last night, we're simply revivifying a technique from Europe in the late 1800s. And Gordon Madding's intraoperative or intrapatic packing from World War II, and then my mentor Chuck Lucas at Detroit in 1976. I will tell the residents, though, packing has always been a little controversial. No one likes leaving foreign bodies in a patient's abdomen that you have to take out. This is probably the single most quoted sentence in all articles on liver trauma in my entire career. And you can read it yourself, but on the other hand, 
the judicious surgeon who chooses this method, packing, should in no way fear the whispered loss of his surgical manhood or womanhood. Alex Walt was a Mayo Clinic trained surgeon who was the long-term chair of surgery at Wayne State in Detroit, one of my mentors, probably one of the most scholarly surgeons we've ever had in academic surgery. Patient number three, a real favorite of mine, Jim Lewis. This is a, a, a chronic alcoholic. He was 54 at the time I met him. He was driving on the loop around the city. He was intoxicated. He was unrestrained, of course, and had a high-speed motor vehicle crash. Much like the patient just presented, he was hypotensive, didn't need to do an ultrasound. He had peritonitis. We were able to get his blood pressure up in the operating room, but once we opened the belly, much to our chagrin, the C loop of the duodenum was devascularized and the head of the pancreas was destroyed right? Not a happy case. Here's a bad protoplasm to begin with, hypotensive patient. You're actually looking through a hole in the head of the pancreas, so you don't have a lot of options here. I will remind you on these organ injury scales that we discussed in the patient earlier, this is just a classic uh, progression and using the pancreas as an example where grade one has hematoma laceration, etc. And this particular patient, the reason I'm showing this is that he has a grade five pancreatic injury, the worst. This is not something you can repair or drain. This is massive disruption of the head. What did I do? I did a total pancreatoduodenectomy. And the rationale was I had a badly bruised pancreas throughout plus the mush in the head. I just thought his pancreas is gonna leak like crazy post-op and I knew some surgical history, as I'll touch on in just a second. So I made this man a total diabetic by my, by my decision in the middle of the night. This is the remnants. Uh, we've got a T-tube above the uh, hepatodoco jejunostomy. That's the portal vein, this pyramesin vein. It's got a total Whipple procedure, total pancreatoduodenectomy. So I show up at the conference and this was at the county hospital in Houston, and two of the most senior surgeons in America, George Jordan, who's now dead, Ken Maddox, who's now the second vice president, oops, I'm sorry, second uh, vice president of American College of Surgeons as of last week, pounded me for 45 minutes. Now remember, I, for the chiefs here, I'm an attending, pretty experienced in trauma, and 45 minutes of that conference were spent yelling at me, total humiliation. How dare you make a patient diabetic? How dare you make a decision like this without calling a senior attendant? Really hurtful comments. And in those days, M&Ms were not civil. And in Texas, they were beyond not civil. They were horrible. I mean, ask anyone, where's Allison? I mean, you remember? I mean, same people were there when she was there. I really took a lot of heat. So, but I, I, you know, I called endo and we put the patient on insulin twice a day. I told him, Jim, I said, you know, your, diabetic, your diabetes will be easier to control if you don't stay an alcoholic. And he looked at me and said, are you nuts? I mean, and even after, our, even after I moved, this patient called me every year, and I always knew it was Jim on the phone because I'd pick up the phone and he'd go, you're the single greatest surgeon there ever was. It was Jim. <laughs> And he called me 19 years in a row. This is a true story. And when he finally didn't call me one year, I actually had his sister's phone number and he had died, but not from diabetes. So it is helpful to know surgical history, as I'll show you in a second, as it relates to this patient. I think your operation has to fit the injury, and it may be sequential operations. And in, in the modern era, I probably wouldn't have done what I did where we took out everything and then put it back together we probably would have done damage control and staggered it. Nobody in the room knows who this individual is, right? This is Jim Priestley. Jim Priestley was a surgeon at the Mayo Clinic who had the unique honor uh, during his career of being both president of the American Medical Association and the American Surgical Association. Every surgeon who trains in any specialty at the Mayo Clinic is invited to join the Priestley Society. It's a wonderful honor. I'm a past president. I really treasure it. Jim Priestley wrote a paper in 1944 describing the first total pancreatectomy in surgical history. 
It's got a long title, again, as patient as papers used to in the past. And I've read the paper, and I knew the story from training at the Mayo about what a huge decision this was in 1944 to make a patient totally diabetic. But I knew patients survived from knowing that paper. Secondly, it was helpful to know what the data were in doing a Whipple for trauma. And these are primarily older series during the heyday of trauma operating. But if you look at the bottom of the slide, and these are all level one trauma centers, the survival for a Whipple for trauma is a surprisingly 75%, and in some centers, frankly, much higher than that. So it helped to know the data on this patient. And thirdly, in subsequent years with damage control, we now know you can do this operation in two or three stages, though for the residents, for each day you delay, their small bowel gets bigger and more swollen. And I can tell you the anastomoses get harder and harder. But if you need to practice damage control, there's literature on it. Let me present another patient who is a 20-year-old man who was shot in the epigastrium. He arrived in the emergency center profoundly hypotensive, again had obvious peritonitis, and through a little bit of dissection, we found a large hole in the abdominal aorta right next to the renals and had an injury to the left kidney as well. And I got myself in one of these situations where I couldn't figure out what to do next because we couldn't get control of the aorta. The bleeding was so fast that I put my finger in it and the kidney was bleeding like stink and we couldn't really get that ele elevated without causing a lot of blood loss. So I had one finger in the aorta with one hand and my pressing on the kidney with the other. And I had a very good chief resident, but the two of us stood there like two dumb people saying, well, what do we do next? And we just couldn't figure it out. I mean, every time I moved my hands, all hell broke loose. And we just couldn't get control of the aorta and the, and the abdomen. Bad situation, we added a thoracotomy. Something I think you need to always think about with bad abdominal trauma. You never want to do it. Be, unless you have to because it really increases your hypothermia, acidosis, and your coagulopathy. And we cross-clamped the aorta. I was able to take my finger out of the aorta. We were able to fix it, did a nephrectomy, et cetera, et cetera. And here's the patient. Um, we were never able to get him back together. And he was discharged home on the 43rd day. That resident to your left had 11 years of training, the residents, three years of cardiac, five of general surgery, and three in the lab at Emory, probably one of the most brilliant residents I've ever trained. So I think he's already a professor. So I had good help on the case, that's my point. So what did I learn on this case? I learned that sometimes you have to add a thoracotomy while you're doing a laparotomy for abdominal trauma. And I learned early on, and I still believe this strongly, that when you're doing damage control procedures and leave patients open, that despite what you've read from a few centers, not all open abdomens can ever be closed, even with the techniques we described on the patient earlier this morning. The other thing I learned is that your indications for doing a thoracotomy in the operating room for trauma are pretty much the same as we always thought you should do them in the emergency center, that particularly, you know, you have a thoracic wound that might involve the heart or the lungs, and the patient's going to bleed death before you get to the operating room, it's worthwhile to do. I know for sure that subclavian vessel injuries that are ble bleeding intrapleurally, they'll exsanguinate before you get control in the upper chest, so you may have to do a thoracotomy. And then, you know, we have all the classic indications in the trauma room, a uh, trauma patient who's failing CPR, you want to do countershock. But I think you have to add to that this concept of intra or pre-laparotomy thoracotomy, so you can do open cardiac massage, and especially as in the patient uh, listed, cross-clamp the descending aorta. So again, for the residents, you want to think about this a little bit because it adds a whole layer of complexity to the patient's care, intra-op and post-op, but if it's the only way to stop the bleeding in the belly or get the heart beating again, it's certainly worthwhile to do, and we can't really get into discussion of blunt trauma indications today because that's so complex. Let me present a patient that broke my heart. You know, you're going to have patients like this, and I think on the trauma service, you're going to have more than elective surgeons ever will. This is a 21-year-old man who was shot in the right upper quadrant, 
much like the other patients I presented. He was profoundly hypotensive and had peritonitis. These were his injuries, and I want you to take good list, good look at this. Mostly transection of his aorta, vena cava, injuries to his renal vein, his kidney, and a pile of GI problems. But as most of you know, whenever you have combined injuries to the inferior vena cava and aorta, mortality in most series is 100%. I mean, it's just too much bleeding, and most of them are going to exsanguinate pre-hospital unless they really get good retroperitoneal tamponade. I had a great fellow with me. We were both pretty experienced, and we really, I thought we did a great job in this. We resected the aorta, put a graft in. We had data at Grady on ligating the cave, and we knew we could get away with it, if you will. We uh, actually were able to stop the bleeding from the renal vein, do a nephrectomy, and then did a bunch of other GI things as listed. He was coagulopathic. This was in the pre-massive transfusion protocol days. So we put lap pads everywhere. We siloed him. And then one of the things I've learned for the residents is if you ligate the vena cava, it may save the patient's life, but a lot of them quickly get a bilateral below knee compartment syndrome. And my policy is if their pressure is already over 30 millimeters at the first operation, I add 20 minutes to the operation and do bilateral fasciotomies. Took him back at 48 hours, and he had survived, you know. And so we were just like patting ourselves, oh, we are so good, and, you know, well, you know, great. And I was, you know, I'd done a lot of reading in my career, and I knew that I had an aortic graft in the retroperitoneum in a thin man, and that I didn't have an aneurysm sac to put over it, and I knew the duodenum was going to lay on it. And I knew these two papers from writing a lot that you probably ought to cover your graph with a piece of omentum. And this is one technique where you split the omentum in the middle, save its blood supply, and flip it back, actually backwards toward the head, and bring it through the mesocolon, and eventually bring, as you can see to the far right, the omentum over your Dacron graph. The other way to do it is just to stretch it around the ligament atrites, and again, cover your graft and keep it away from the duodenum as it pulsates. So we did damage control. We re-opt, re-opt, re-opt. He had a really slow recovery. Any of you have done near-death patients know they don't bounce back right away. And I got what is surely the most depressing phone call of my entire career because I knew what was happening. The resident called me and said, on day 37, the patient's entire hospital room is full of blood that he's vomiting, and he just arrested. I took him back to surgery. It was an incredibly difficult re-op. I made a terrible mistake here. I should have opened his chest to clamp the aorta, as on the previous patient. But I thought I could get to his aorta, and I found the belly was like concrete. By the time I had finished, I had cleaned out the regional blood bank, and the patient died on the table. I used 91 units of blood at my re-operation. He had an aorta duodenal fistula, and the reason it had occurred was that the omentum that I had so carefully put over the aortic graft had slipped one centimeter, and the suture line was now exposed to the back of the duodenum. So I, I made a mistake, and I didn't do well on the re-op. So what I learned from this case was that trauma can be a very disheartening part of the general surgeon's experience. You save all these patients. You have some who never do well for reasons we don't always understand. Probably now we think it may be genetics. We have patients, particularly with gunshot wounds, who get horrific complications. And the other mistake I made in this case is I tried to prevent a complication thinking, wow, I'm so well read, I know how to do this. But I didn't do it right. I didn't fixate the amenum properly. I should have put a lot more sutures there to hold it in place because once the patient's bowel starts moving, the amenum moves too. And I just didn't fixate it well enough, and this patient died. Let me finish up with a lady who became a dear friend. This is a 53-year-old woman from Augusta, Georgia, who was on state business in Atlanta. It was in a parking lot a couple blocks from Grady, and another car was coming down the parking lot, and the driver lost control, and the patient's leg was crushed between her car bumper where she was standing and the other car. 
she, I got a phone call that, from one of my partners, and he said, this patient has a blood pressure of 90 and she has a mangled extremity. So we quickly took her to the operating room to fix this or amputate it, as you often do. And she had the classic grade 3C, a Dr. Gastillo grade 3C open fracture. And for the students, what that means is one is a small break in the skin with an open fracture, two is a bigger break and some other a bigger break in the skin and some other injuries. Grade three means an additional all your soft tissue and bone problems. You have loss of the artery to the extremity, like the popliteal or the uh, tibioperineal trunk or something. So she had an open right knee dislocation. She had a vulsion of the main blood supply to her foot, her popliteal artery and vein. And she had a vulsion of her anterior tibial, tibial artery and vein to her anterior compartment. And in addition, she had an open grade two right tibial fracture. But for the residents, you know, I examined this lady before she went to sleep and she could feel her toes and she could move her toes. And that's really critical, right? To know if their extremity is functional because it's going to impact whether you choose to save it or not. This is Dr. Gustillo's second paper. I'd recommend the residents read this um, from Ramsey St. Paul in Minnesota. He described the one, two, and three classification in his first paper. Then four years later said, my classification's not precise enough. I'm gonna add subcategories A, B, and C to the worst open fractures. So three C is a mangled extremity or less than mangling, but it's a bad situation because you've got all these injuries and no arterial inflow. What we did with this particular patient the first night is we quickly shunted her popliteal artery and vein, ligated her anterior tibial artery and vein. Ortho came in, took a little bit of time, but they put a fixator on her knee, which had been badly dislocated, rotted her tibia, which was a grade two. And then in the same setting, this is a nine hour operation, uh, we scrubbed back in the middle of the night, took out our shunts and put in saphenous vein grafts. And then we did two of her four compartments and I, I no longer recall why I didn't do all four, but I, which I usually do. But we grafted both her popteal artery and vein. I know the residents are familiar with this, but in bad situations in extremities or elsewhere where you're uncomfortable ligating the artery and vein, that intraluminal shunning is a great thing to do. This is another patient uh, showing a, a number 12 argyle shunt in the popliteal artery. And I think it's a number 24 argyle chest tube in the popliteal vein. And for those of you who haven't seen these, it temporarily restores arterial inflow and venous outflow and lets orthopedic do their stuff and it keeps the foot alive or the hand alive or whatever. Shunts are really interesting. There was a paper in 1971 after one of the first Israeli wars and the author wrote in the paper, which for the residents you should never do, to the best of our knowledge, this surgical technique, this is 1971, has not yet been applied in vascular injuries of the extremities. And this paper has been quoted 10,000 times in trauma centers. They were completely wrong. Nobody knows who this is and there are actually no pictures available because I called the Royal College of Surgeons in England. This is Sir George Makins who was a former president of that college. And this is a book Dr. Makins wrote after World War I. This is the surgeon who figured out in World War I you could fix blood vessels. And there's a chapter in this book called The Provision of a Temporary Conduit in Place of Immediate Occlusion of a Vessel. So for the residents who went to academic surgery and want to write a lot of papers, my suggestion is to trace what you're writing about historically and find out where it all started, as I mentioned many times last night. We took this particular lady back to surgery on all those post-op days, debridements, washouts, flaps, skin graft, because this was a true mangle extremity. I mean, there were gaping soft tissue injuries, knee dislocation, fracture, artery and vein gone and we discharge her on the 38th day. Here she is eight months later, one of our skin grafts on the back of her leg where she had a big soft tissue injury, one of our anterior fasciotomy sites. Here she is three years and 10 months 
status post-injury. When she came to my office on this day, she was walking with a cane and for some reason, like I became infuriated with this patient. I said, why are you using a cane? She said, well, I have to. I said, oh, for God's sakes. I said, I did eight operations on you. Don't walk with a cane, you're breaking my heart. So we went outside next to Grady and I took away her cane. I said, go to the corner and come back. You know, you have to be firm with your patients, guys and ladies. And she walked without a cane. What did I learn? These are tough problems. A mangled extremity is not a one-man job, right? It's a full-time job for a multidisciplinary trauma team that will include, you know, general vascular surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, plastic surgeons, occasionally neurosurgeons. You want to get everybody in the operating room, if possible, the first night, or at least at the re-op, to sort out the sequence on how you're going to fix the mangle extremity. And for the residents, when you see one of these in West Virginia, I want you to ask four questions immediately. If the patient's life is in danger, let's say from other injuries, shouldn't I just cut off the bad leg or arm? That's the first question you have to answer. Secondly, well, my patient is stable, but knowing the data, should I actually attempt salvage or should I just cut off the patient's leg and give them a prosthesis, right? We have all these kids in Iraq and Afghanistan, the American troops who are being amputated, and they seem to be doing fine. They're running marathons, et cetera. Number three, if I decide I'm going to do salvage instead of amputation, your third question should be, who should go first, right? Should the orthopedic surgeon stabilize the flail extremity or should the trauma vascular surgeon put in shunts? And that's a decision you reach based on the blood flow to the foot or hand. And finally, the hardest one of all is that if you decide to salvage an extremity and it doesn't work, when should you amputate? And these are really questions that require a lot of thinking and knowing a little bit about the outcome of these patients. What we do know in the modern era on mangled extremities is that there are some absolute indications in the lower extremity for cutting it off. And I will tell you, if your tibial nerve is gone, don't save it, right? This is not China. We don't put legs back on. They'll end up with a claw foot, and they'll never be able to walk properly, cut off the extremity. If you're in a rural state and you get transfers to your trauma center, and I can tell you, if you have somebody with no flow to the foot or the hand for over six hours and they have a mangled extremity, cut it off. It ain't going to work. They're going to get all sorts of infections. And, and Richard Lang and Kai Johansson both said warm ischemia, which means you still have some collateral flow. So that's actually a good situation. Certainly if you have cold ischemia, a cold insensate foot when the patient arrives, cut it off. And then they have these relative things. If you have many other injuries, don't deal with extremity, cut it off. If the same foot is injured, cut it off because it's never going to work. And in certain patients with limited resources, no social help, da da da, an anticipated protracted course, cut it off. And here's the reason for the residents. This is the single most frightening series in the University of Cincinnati back in the 80s. And I mentioned the Gustillo classification, A, B, and C. The amputation rate eventually in this series was 80% of the three Cs. It's closer to 35% in the modern era, but Half the patients got infected in that series with salvage and 80% required amputation. So what I told this woman's husband, this is a very wealthy family, very, very knowledgeable. And I told the husband the first night when I came out of the operating room, I said, I chose to salvage your wife's leg, but I want you to know she's going to have six to eight operations. She had eight. That half the patients I've done this on will come to amputation later because of pain bad function or infection. And I said, there's a high likelihood she will have a chronic disable, disabling injury in that extremity. I said, do you understand that? And her children were there too. And they were just taken aback. What kind of surgeon are you that you're predicting a 50% late amputation? And you know, you just have to talk a family through. And what for the residents, what we often did at Grady is that we would bring a family member into the operating room put them in scrubs, put on a hat, and I'd bring them in the operating room either before amputation or salvage, and I'd say, this is the artery, it's gone, 
This is the nerve that's stretched. This is the bone that's lost its periosteum. I want you to understand how bad this injury is. So I found that very helpful, and many trauma centers are uncomfortable with this, and I don't know why, because nothing is worse than amputating a young patient at a level one trauma center where they expect you to save everything, every limb, every life, and not giving the family warning, and there's some backstory there. So what have I, I told you today in the MOOCA lecture? On the first patient, it helped to really know the anatomy around the thoracic inlet and the fact there are a lot of incisions that will get you where you want to go. Number two, I became much more sensitive when a resident or fellow called me. I think I was cavalier when I was young, and now you sort of pick up nuances that the, the, the trainee is a little uncomfortable, doesn't understand what you're saying. Go, to the, go meet with that individual. Get off the phone. And again, something I believe in every day, even where I am now, take care of the patient first. If you have to break a rule or two that's not going to get you fired, do it. Because I can tell you in personal experience, someday you're going to be that patient or your spouse, your children, your parents. And you don't want half-assed doctors taking care of you. Thirdly, on the pancreatectomy, I, I learned a lot because the patient had a great long survival. And I knew the history, and I knew it was safe to do what I did, but boy, did I take a beating. Fourthly, don't be afraid to add a thoracotomy in selected trauma patients. It adds, again, a layer of complexity to their care, but it may save their life. In the horrible patient or the horrible situation in which the patient died, I, I made a terrible mistake technically, and I just, I was so excited about saving this patient, I think I just wasn't cautious enough at the re-op to do everything perfectly. And finally, in the lady with the mangle extremity, I, I think you have to individualize your care here as you do every day. And in this particular lady with a lot of resources, strong family support, and an intact nerve, it was the right thing to do to save the mangle extremity. I want to thank uh, Don and Allison again and all of you for the privilege of giving the Peter Mooka lecture. I'm really pleased that you honor Peter, Peter this way. I will call his wife, Sonia, when I get back tomorrow and reiterate to her this is still an ongoing uh, entity. Thank you again for the privilege. Thank you.